Crevi numbers. They tell us a lot, don't they? And the numbers in that video showed how the world is changing, how society is adapting, how we compare with others, and a reminder of what the future looks like. The numbers are also concrete, scientific, and at times reassuring. But do they tell the whole picture? I'm going to talk to you this morning about how they don't. How the public sector needs to get beyond the numbers if it is to improve well-being in Wales, and if it is to truly understand the whole picture. Well, I can wear the right side of the hell, as I did up here. In a few weeks' time, I'll be publishing a report that paints a picture of public services in Wales. The report will look at the Welsh public sector journey over the last five years, examine what the challenges are that we are facing, what the future looks like, and what the public sector needs to do to survive and thrive in the next few years. On the face of it, we have what some may see as an impossible mountain to climb. The UK public services have faced the longest period of sustained real-term spending cuts, five years so far, and the constraints, despite some of the encouraging uh, messages um, in the autumn statement, the constraints are set to continue. The November 2015 spending review shows there will be further spending cuts in Wales. The overall block grant will fall by half a billion pounds over the next four years, and that will come entirely out of the revenue budget. In total, according to our initial analysis, the period of austerity from 2010 to 2020 will have seen revenue spending on services in Wales fall by just around 10%. That's the initial assessment, but um, we're still looking at the detail to see if there are any more surprises hidden in the small print. Add to this the demographic pressures on public services, as that um, uh, video reminded us, with older and younger populations set to grow in Wales, there will be an even further increase on demand on schools and health and social care. And in terms of older people, we are more effective than England because more people choose to come to Wales to enjoy their retirement. So the picture is certainly one of challenge to deliver public services efficiently and effectively through this period of austerity, not just for today's citizens, but for future generations. And while number crunching can tell us more and more about the scale and nature of the problem, no calculator is going to give us the solutions. If we're going to radically rethink how we deliver services, we need to start seeing those services from the perspective of the user and not that of the deliverer. As the Minister reminded us, there's some very aspirational legislation in the form of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which comes into force next April, which it is hoped will help us do that. Although I have to say, it's disappointing to see that the new draft local government bill doesn't seem to reflect the spirit of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in its content at all. Because the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act puts the individual at the centre of public service policy instead of the organisations that deliver the services. It's about shaping the future of public services by providing a framework for making better decisions which could set Wales on course to become more prosperous, equal, resilient and healthy. The question is whether all of us, politicians and public sector officers alike, really understand the behavioural change that is needed for this legislation to have real impact. Based on our initial work and conversations, I have to say that I think the jury is out. Indeed, as I preferred earlier, I do wonder whether there's a real understanding that this legislation is coming into force at all. But it is coming, and we are all included. All our organisations need to embrace the spirit of the Act and we all need to play our part in achieving what the legislation is trying to do in reality. It requires that we put five principles at the heart of our decision-making. The long-term, 
That's balancing short-term needs of today with the needs of tomorrow. Prevention, acting to stop problems occurring in the first place or getting worse. Integration, considering how our actions may impact on the well-being goals or objectives of other public bodies. Collaboration, working with others. And involvement, making sure we involve people in our goals. And another key to making better and well-informed decisions, as the Minister has emphasised, is to evaluate not just the balance sheet and the financial bottom line, but also behaviours, sentiments and outcomes. As public finance professionals, senior leaders within your organisations, you need to be central to this. Public bodies could provide fantastic services that meet the needs of current users, but give no thought at all to sustainability or the impact on future generations. And that's why we need to start taking a much longer term view. And easy to say, but in a parliamentary system that looks at public services on a short term basis and in electoral cycles, I think that's going to be extremely difficult to achieve. If we really need to start looking ahead some 20, 30, 40 years away, our medium term planning which currently is looking at three to five years, is a hopelessly inadequate. We need to go beyond that. Indeed, it may well be that we need to start making decisions that might not be in the best short-term financial interest now. But we also need to look at our performance information. And here I would again urge caution. My recent report on NHS waiting times for elective surgery found that so much effort was placed on actual waiting times and not so much on whether a person was better off at the end of the day from having had any kind of treatment. So the numbers don't really tell the whole story. On the one hand, we're complaining, or the politicians complain perhaps, that waiting times are increasing. But at the same time, they also say that people's satisfaction levels remain fairly high with the NHS. Of course, satisfaction levels can be high because people may not be well informed about any alternative. But whatever the reason, there's a real disconnect between complaint and satisfaction. During the summer, NHS England announced it was scrapping two key waiting time targets. There were those who argued it was a political move, it was convenient to do so. But whatever the motive, I certainly applaud the move away from having a slavish focus on chasing numbers and targets. Numbers are important, but alone they don't address the real issues. Sometimes they, they cloud and distort and can be harmful. You don't, I'm sure, need to remind me, uh, remind you of mid staffs what we learned about the effects of sacrificing patient care at the altar of fantastic KPIs and targets that that hospital uh, group was achieving. And we need, and I've already referred to this, to be aware of comparisons. It's important to be able to understand and learn from differences across the UK, but increasing divergences in the way things are measured at the moment are potentially getting in the way of such simplistic comparisons. Of course, we're going to hear a lot over the next three or four months about service in the UK, how health and education compares here in Wales and in England. But it's almost impossible, I think, for the general public to fully understand how Wales really compares with the rest of Great Britain. Of course, the fact we lack a mature media market in Wales does impact on that. But it's also, I think, an indication that we, as the public service deliverers, ourselves need to fully understand how things differ, how they can compare, delving below the headline figures. Because if we are to learn and improve in North Wales, we need to look across uh, office life, we need to look at other countries, and we can't revert to a not invented here argument or this is the Welsh solution. We need to compare that elsewhere and be satisfied that it stands up. And what I can't stress enough, of course, is that behind the numbers are real people. How people feel about a service is just as important, sometimes more so. We're
reminded recently about the crime surveys for England and Wales showing 7% drop in crime levels, but that same survey revealed that 61% of people thought crime had risen over the last few years. How do you square that? How do you make people feel safe? It's important to know, isn't it, what people think about us, our services, the results we achieve. We need to be conscious of the perception out there because opinion can fluctuate, it can certainly be wrong, but perception is an extremely costly uh, thing. Some of you may remember a few years back at CBI conference, Cyril Bratner and his throwaway comments poking fun at the quality of his high street jewellery chain. It crashed in terms of value on the third night. And just this summer, SeaWorld in Florida saw 84% wiped off its profits after the lead singer of One Direction shouted, don't go to SeaWorld, it's live on stage. His comments went viral across the world via social media. Four words, responsible for a large-scale change in perception. So there's a challenge for us. How do we track opinion, change the narrative before an issue turns into a crisis? And a word of caution, of course, measuring opinion perception on its own is not a measure of success. I'm sure you remember the failure of almost all opinion polls and the media to correctly predict the general election results last May. But it should be part of the mix. Ignoring it is not an option. It's about gathering intelligence and knowing what matters to people. <coughs> you can have a target for community nurses, for example, to spend five minutes with a patient changing their dressing. What if they spent 10 minutes, <clears throat> an extra five of that, chatting to the lonely, isolated patient in their home? That resident might feel better served and would certainly have an impact on their well-being. Changing the dressing alone would have met their clinical need, but that would meet their community needs. In September, uh, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in England published its first guidance for the social care sector on home care services for older people. It said home care visits lasting less than half an hour should only be made in limited circumstances. How does that sit with a care and support system under enormous financial pressure? But through rethinking services, through co-production, through collaboration with the third sector, through a community-based approach, it should be possible to deliver what actually matters to people. In October, I published a report on the independence of older people. And it was very clear, I think, and I do, do recommend you read that report, it's very clear the Welsh public sector needs to shift its focus and approach. Because many preventative services were undervalued. And this, in turn, can only result in increased demand for health and social care. Community-based services are vital to the well-being of residents and should be an integral part of service planning. These services help support older people in living independently, and they can help public services save money too. Taking managed risks and a more strategic financial management approach, we can direct resources and effort away from acute and towards preventative action. If fewer people need more responsive services as a result, that's a good outcome for us all, surely. I mentioned outcome, but all too often uh, people are very reluctant to let go of simply measuring output and activity as the basis for decision making. It takes real bravery, I think, to step out aside from that and look at outcome. So let me tell you a story about a real person. I'll call her Ruth. In 1996, Ruth first approached her local authority for some support. Over the next 16 years, she had 129 different interactions with the public sector, ranging from support to run a business with her husband, then needing help with children after becoming a single parent, to having her children removed when her health deteriorated. And she eventually became entirely dependent on the public purse. What Ruth actually wanted when she contacted the authorities in the first place were things like help with the housework and gaining access to the upstairs of the house. Both, she said, would have a profound effect on her and her children's lives. 
What Ruth received was the same anger management course twice for her two boys, the same parenting program twice, help cleaning one bedroom, toilet frame, perching stool, and bath board for a bath that she couldn't actually access, and a family intervention program. What she got cost just over 106,000, and none of the interventions ever got to the bottom of her problems. What she really wanted in the first place would have cost the local authority probably just around 20,000. So the whole process was both expensive for the public purse and frustrating for Ruth and the people involved, who saw her circumstances deteriorate to the point that crisis intervention was required. But this is a good news story, because following a system review, the council and its partners piloted a locality-based model in a few parts of the city. Ruth was taken on by one of the new pilot wellbeing teams, which assigns a key worker who's able to really identify a person's needs and bring the support to them rather than having the individual do the round, uh, seeking help from different places. This approach delivers services on what the customers actually need rather than assumptions. It cuts down the number of professionals and organisations each customer has to engage with by allocating the generic worker. Ruth is now in a suitable accommodation with her children, who have been returned to her, and her situation has stabilised. So my message is, is really about going beyond the numbers. I'm not saying that data isn't important. After all, I'm the Auditor General. So of course I know the value of good data. But we need to use it alongside other measures if we're to see the big picture and deliver what really matters to Wales. And you, Finance professionals are all key to this. Sadly, I see organisations sidelining the finance function and even downgrading the role of finance director in these times of austerity. But service planning and remodelling needs to be done with the finance director as a business partner. Otherwise, there will always be a mismatch between an organisation's services, its finances and its financial impact. There's some really good examples, of course, to draw on, on from the private sector. Unilever, for example, integrating the financial focus with people, environment, and social factors. But I'd agree with John Madison that there is a need to really look at the finance as a whole. And too often, we're blocked from doing so because decisions have, have been made in which finance professionals have unfortunately not been at the table. I have to say, and I think I'd comment on this one, that I feel that the new local government bill, as currently drafted, is calling into question my constitutional independence in Wales. I should emphasise that my role, and that of the Wales Audit Office, is to help public bodies, the public and service users, to see and understand the whole picture, not to deliver a government agenda, and not just in financial management. I, together with my staff, will support you over the next few years through our work to help identify what you're doing well and highlighting where you can improve. For example, we're planning to make changes to our grant certification to ensure we have an increased focus on outcomes, no longer just checking that the money has been spent properly, moving from process to what it was intended the grant should achieve. My Good Practice Exchange team run with the support of the National Assembly many free seminars highlighting notable practice in areas which are relevant to managing services in today's climate. Looking at areas such as well-being, making a reality of integration, the importance of trust in organisations, faster closure of accounts and governance. Good Practice may be a poor traveller at times, but I do urge you to come along to them. The seminars are a good opportunity to learn and share your learning with others because we're all in this together. There's no one right answer. We need to learn from each other. I also now have a new duty, to audit how public bodies are responding to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. It's an important new role, and I want you to help me, because I think the last thing that we need in Wales is yet another extra audit uh, system overlaid on what we already have. I want to work with 
the newly appointed Future Generations Commission, when she takes that post, to build a meaningful approach to come up with an integrated way of assessing public bodies in Wales using both financial and non-financial information so that public services can be helped to deliver now and in the future the wellbeing legislation. I'm therefore planning early in the new year to publish a consultation document on this and on related changes in local government audit, though I should stress this is a paper which shouldn't just be read by local government audit, it will apply to the, all the public sector in Wales. And what I want is to have an engagement with you in the early parts of next year um, in order to develop a new approach. My desire to have as light a touch a risk-based and proportionate audit regime as possible, not one which is built on regulation and enforcement. As I consider my strategic priorities for the next three years, as um, Yolo reminded you, I've been in post for five, so I've got three left before I retire for the, I think, the third time, but I think this time so it will be a final retirement. Um, I can tell you, so next three years ago, and I can tell you that I want to increase my focus on encouraging public services to transform. And the message I have delivered over the last five years is the same as John Madison. Take well-managed risks. We will never break through unless we take those risks, unless we embrace failure. And I think that is a problem. The problem is that of the politician, I'm afraid, and not the media, seeking to find who is to blame. My concern, and has been throughout my period, and will continue to be, is that we learn. We live our lives from our mistakes. I don't think we can do it on being perfect and never making a mistake in our lives. And so why should it be different at work? So, we need to take those well-managed risks, and we need to learn from um, successes and failures. I'll be looking to move more in the next three years at pan-sector studies in Wales, looking at lessons learned and how they can be applied across the entire public sector. In terms of the traditional audit approach, I'm hoping to do more investigative work, responding more swiftly to issues as they arise, rather than taking the longer term uh, value for money study every time. And whilst I want to focus more on governance and accountability issues, including the challenges and oversight of arms length delivery mechanisms, I want to do so in terms of better supporting an effective public service finance professional. We were reminded in the video about the um, extent to which people move jobs. Um, and we'll continue to move jobs in the future. We're looking to increase our yearly audit trainee intake at the Wales Audit Office to at least 10 trainees a year, if not more. As part of their training, um, I've managed to successfully convince the um, Finance Committee of the National Assembly that we should be helped from the uh, Wales Consolidated Fund to place some of our audit trainees on secondments with other public sector organisations in Wales. Partly because they'll help get a good insight of what would happen, so not just as auditors, but also from within. But also because when their placements finish, the reality is that many of our trainees will leave the Wales Audit Office. And I'd like to ensure, think that they will get a job within the wider public sector in Wales. And I don't see this as being just the Wales Audit Office. I would really like to develop a trainee pattern across the Wales public sector in which we do bring on people to train whatever with NHS, uh, Welsh Government, local government, or the Wales Audit Office, or wherever. But then get them to understand other parts of the Wales public sector and try and retain them. We need to grow our uh, uh, public uh, sector professionals in Wales. I'd like to end by quoting an English theologian from the 17th century, um, Richard Hooker. He said that change is not made without inconvenience, 
even from worse to better. Uh, it's an underline that change is uncomfortable, but the reality is the sooner we achieve the change, the better. I've been arguing the case, I hope, in this speech for transformational change. If we are to transform services in these times of austerity, we need to transform our thinking, our perspective, our decision making. We also need to build the capacity of the public and public bodies to engage with each other, learning lessons from programs like Communities First. And we need to move away from a one-size-fits-all public service provision towards diverse local provision of services that match what people say matters to them, what they want, enable them to achieve the outcomes they identify. We're coming up to an election. Wales needs both politicians and officials who are prepared to see the longer term goal to try and deliver the aspirations of the well-being of future generations and who are ready to take well-managed risks and even short-term costs to achieve that. Because risks to refashion our public services need to take into account information and measurements that are more than just mathematical equations. The trick for all of us is to combine accurate numeracy with convincing narrative. And that is our challenge, all of us in the public sector in Wales. Thank you very much.